Welcome to Sermons from Silver Moon with Pastor Phil Barber of the Silver Moon Full Gospel Church. The Silver Moon Full Gospel Church is committed to preaching the Word of God and invites you to join them for Sunday morning worship at 10 a.m. and Wednesday night service at 6.30. Now, here's Pastor Phil Barber with today's message. The title of the message this morning is Home. If you remember, the first sermon that we preached was Sick of Home. And then last week we mentioned two points, sick away from home, and then homesick. And today's main point is he's going to be home. When a father runs and embraces his lost son and kisses him, you are going to see the Bible in one of the grandest pictures ever painted in words. This is humanity's story. And this is God's story. Time and eternity intersect. Approaching death and everlasting life touch each other. Sin and forgiveness embrace. The human and the divine become one. We have in this story, especially in this passage, infinite infinite compassion, unconditional love, everlasting forgiveness, Divine realities radiating from a father who is like God, the creator of heaven and earth. Here come in this story both the human and the divine, the fragile and the powerful, the mortal and the eternal. Now going back to last week's sermon, we have the young boy, the prodigal son, who strayed away from his family, a picture of a man straying away from God. It had an epiphany. He had an awakening. He had a realization that the man who worked for his father had more to eat than he had to. We saw his resolution. He said, I will get up and go to my father. We saw his repentance. I will tell my father that I've sinned against heaven and I have sinned against you. His resignation, that he was not worthy to be called his father's son, but he would plead that his father would hire him as a day laborer. And we saw his return, that he would get up and go to his father. He could have recognized his condition and his need and never returned. But hallelujah, he arose and came. Having come to himself, he made a decision. And what a decision it was. It was a decision to go home. And so, look at slide three. I want you to see something, that he rehearsed what he was going to tell his father. I don't know if you've ever had an important meeting where you had something you wanted to say to someone that you wanted to make sure was clear and that you would talk to yourself and you would repeat it to yourself and you'd even say it out loud to yourself to see how it sounded. Well, this is what this boy was doing in verses 18 through 20a. He was rehearsing what he was going to say. And he says, starting with verse 18, I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. And here's the day's text. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him. And kissed him. This is God's word for God's people. And all God's people said, thanks be to God. I would go ahead and say it one time. Just practice. Thanks be to God. If you'll learn to say that, digital will think you guys might really mean that. Okay. Amen. Sorry. This is where we left off the last time. Last time. Life did not go for the prodigal son as he anticipated. The boy disgraced himself at the beginning of their story by requesting his inheritance and there and there debased himself even further by selling his inheritance. He dishonored his father, he dishonored his family, he dishonored his community, and he dishonored his God. As the prodigal returned to the village, he expected now let me tell you, he expected his father to remain aloof in the house while he made his way through the village streets. To say the least, this is what would have happened. The villagers would have subdued him, stopped him, made fun of him, mocked him, and laughed at him as he made his way towards his father's house. 
And as soon as they learned that he had lost his inheritance in the Gentile land, in a Gentile land, they would have stopped him and made him sit outside the gate of his family home. And they would make him wait until his father summoned him into the house. With the family already rejecting him, the father would be angry, they thought. And the boy would be obliged to apologize for everything he had done and plead for job training he's asking. But not job training in that village, job training in another village. It'd be like he is a complete outcast. But he had hoped that his father would be merciful. And he is placing everything on that reality. If he, if his father had no mercy, he would not survive. At that point, the crowd is imagining his response. They're wondering, what will the father do? What will the father say? And if you're asking the Pharisees, and if you're asking some Christians, the answer is clear. There is no coming back realistically. None at all. To come back, the boy would have to make a restitution for everything. And he had no money, so that would be impossible because he had squandered it all. It's gone. There would be the moral shame that he would have to pay for every day of his life. There would be the loss of trust that he would have to earn back. There would be the painful task of trying to rebuild the shattered reputation. But in this culture and in some churches, there's no returning. Not for this boy. That ship had sailed. That bridge had been burnt. That door had been closed. And from the crowd's perspective, who is listening to Jesus tell this story, this boy is already dead. dead. That's where they're at. So the crowd is anticipating what kind of reception this boy would receive. And it wasn't going to be good, according to them. So my first point this morning is, it's going to be a little different. I think you'll get it as we go through it. Eyes. Eyes that you see with. And it says in verse 20, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. Some preachers paint this that the old man sat in a rocking chair every day on his porch and he was looking down the road. Well, we really don't know if that's true or not. He might have, he might have been in the field watching his workers. He might have been in his garden, uh, uh, playing with his tomatoes, uh, plants or whatever he might have been growing there. But whatever he was doing, he looked up and suddenly saw someone a long ways off. There was someone on the horizon and he could tell he was a young man. I wonder, did he recognize this boy immediately? Did he stop and wonder, is that the boy? Is that my son? The father had never pushed this boy out of his mind. This father had never written him off. This father had never moved on from him. Even though this son was offensive, even though this son was living far away and squandering his inheritance, Even though this boy was engaged in unacceptable behavior, the father never quit watching for a future day of redemption. Now, the crowd doesn't realize that. You and I realize that because we know the end of the story. We can go back to the very beginning of mankind. We can see Adam and Eve rebelling in the Garden of Eden. We can see their sin, we can see their separation, we can see their shame, but we can also see a searching God who is asking the question, where are you? See, God has always been looking a long ways off for the day of redemption. In that story of chapter Gen- in Genesis chapter 3, where Adam and Eve had rebelled and sinned against God and it looked like all hope was gone, We read that God was anticipating a day when mankind would return. For the scripture says, the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And here's the anticipation. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. 
He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Even on that day, with that announcement, God was already looking a long way off when the Savior would crush the serpent's head. And this is God's outlook. This is God's mentality throughout the Scripture. You find it in Noah's Ark. It was provided to bring salvation to mankind. You see it with Abraham on Mount Moriah. You see it with the Passover lamb in the book of Exodus. And manna from heaven. And water from the rock at Horeb. You see this anticipation in the tabernacle. You see it in the scapegoat in Leviticus. And you see it in the book of Isaiah. Where a child is born of a virgin. The dry branch and the suffering servant of Isaiah chapter 53. And those are just a few mentions of the Old Testament. There's prophecy and after prophecy after prophecy of God looking a long way off to the day of salvation when mankind would come to Jesus Christ and he's looking a long ways off for some of you this morning. It's a day that God looked to eagerly as his father looked forward to. God is not a reluctant Savior. That's why I, as I sat there and I thought, oh God, I, there are people who come to this church that aren't here this morning that need to realize that God is not a reluctant Savior. It doesn't matter what they've done. It doesn't matter where they've been. God is looking for them to come forward and say, Father, I have sinned against you and I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned and I'm not worthy, but I am coming for to you, and I want to know what you are going to do. This dad is looking down this long road that's been empty day after day, hoping this boy would not come back, that he would never see him again. He has lived every day with anticipation for the day that this boy would appear on the horizon, headed towards home. That's why when we read the Christmas story, this anticipation that God had been, been uh, uh, that he had, is suddenly he began to realize it's all coming to pass. And that's why the angels came and told the shepherds that there was a baby born in a manger in Bethlehem. That's why there was a star sent to lead wise men from the far east to the little town of Bethlehem to that manger. That's why Anna and Simeon were able to see the baby Jesus in the temple of Jerusalem. That's why at the baptism of John, the dove, the Holy Spirit descended from heaven and God spoke from heaven. That's why at the transfiguration, God said, this is my son, hear him. And that's why on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit descended from heaven and filled mankind with his presence, God has anticipated that moment. He looked forward to it, that when he and mankind would come together, God wants to be you to be in his life. He wants you to be in his home and in his heaven. This is the mindset of the scripture throughout. First Timothy chapter two, three, th- th- verses three and four says, This is a good and acceptable in the sight of God. Our Savior, listen, who desires all men, all men, you, 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 all men. To be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. That's why the Apostle Peter wrote in Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness. But is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all, A-L-L, for all to come to repentance. God our Father is eager. For his sons, for people to come home, to come to him. That is his desire. And there the boy is. He's as wretched as misery itself. He's as filthy as hogs. He has been feeding hogs, slopping them, walking in their manure, in the mud and muck with them. His clothes hang about him as rags because he's lost so much weight. And what is on the outside of him is on the inside of him. He is disgraced in the eyes of good people. Here he is, filthy, dirty, smelly. He doesn't have money to clean up before he comes home. He doesn't have money to buy new clothes before he comes home. And most of all, he's an alien. He's a stranger. He's unwanted in the village. And he wonders if he's unwanted and an alien in his father's house. But you know what? He knows it. For he will say, I've sinned against heaven, and I've sinned against you. 
He has wasted his money on harlots, drugs, liquor, sinful friends. He's turned his back on his parents' love. He has done evil with his mind and soul and body. And there he comes. Despite this confession, just what I've described to you, even though he has said within himself, I have sinned, you know something? His confession has not removed his griefs. It's just not enough to say, I've sinned. You say, what do you mean, Pastor? You need the Father to forgive you. He's made the confession, but he doesn't know what his Father will do. Listen to me. This story is telling you what God will do if you'll make your confession and come to him. This is one of the greatest verses in the Bible. Now, if I had a pen, I'd write, underline everything I'm going to tell you. Just the word Saul. And then I'm going to have you underline the word compassion. Then I'm going to have you underline the word ran. Then I'm going to have you underline the word embrace. And then I'm going to have you underline the word kiss. Yes, he's confessed. Yes, he's acknowledged that he's not worthy. He's not even worthy to be called a son. He knows that. Let me tell you something about repentance. True repentance has come in a place where you realize you are a sinner and you're not worthy of God. And your unworthiness is not removed because of your consciousness of it. It'll only be removed if you realize it and God says, welcome home. This boy has no claims on God's love. You've got to get this through your head. You and I deserve nothing from God. Nothing good. If the father shuts the door in this boy's face, the father acts with justice towards the boy. If the father refuses to speak as much as a single word, except words, a baby of rebuke, no one would blame the father, for the son has so sadly sinned and erred. When he says he has sinned, he is confessing that he deserves no mercy, no grace, but to be cast away forever. Did you get what I'm saying? That's what you're saying. I've sinned. I don't deserve anything from God. This boy deserved justice. He deserved judgment. And he has no doubt of that because he says, I'm not worthy. I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against heaven, against you. I'm not asking to come home. I'm not asking to sit around the table at home. I'm not asking for my old bedroom back. I'm not asking for my old position back. Just maybe make me a hired servant so my life would be just a little bit better. But he's realized, I don't deserve any of that. There's not one thing he can do to alter his sinful condition except Come and throw himself on God. This boy has no rights. He threw them away. He cannot demand anything else from him. So he demanded his inheritance and God gave, his father gave it to him, but now he has nothing, no right to demand anything. If this boy's father turns his back on him, there's not one thing the boy can do. Not one thing. Except say simply this. I deserve it. When a person recognizes his sinfulness, that he's offended God and stands before him, he knows the same thing. If God turns his back on you, listen to me, you deserve it. If he casts your soul in hell, you deserve it. If your soul were sent to hell, his righteous law approves it. And so does your own conscience. You can see your rags if you really look at yourself. You can mark your filthiness. You can long for something better, but you're no better off. You have no claims to mercy. When you say, I have sinned, you have convicted yourself. You say, Pastor, that's hard. Well, it's the first step. To say, I'm guilty. To convict yourself. And then you need to come and cast yourself on God. What is a father going to do now that he has, see, that he has seen his son in his filthy rags, covered with the muck and mud and manure of hogs, broke and worthless? What will this dad do? 
when he sees this boy. And so we're going to move from the eye to the heart. And it says, and felt compassion for him. Now, where the word compassion is and the idea is it right here in the bowels. This is where you feel pain for others. But this is how this dad felt. He hurt in his gut when he saw his son in the condition that he was. He hurt. And when you hurt like that, it's love. And he was saying, I guess, I love this boy with all my bowels, with all my being. I hurt for him. The father hurt in the deepest part of his gut when he saw this boy. You might say, as we say, his heart hurt. But God is this way and his taught. Jesus said, when you have seen me, you have seen the father. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, it says, seeing the people, he felt compassion for them. He hurt for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. And when Jesus saw that these people were skinned and discarded, sheep, he inwardly hurt for them. Again in Matthew 14, 14, when he went ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt compassion for them and healed their sick. Jesus hurt for the plight of man's humanity. And that's where we are in this story. This father hurts for his son. He sees him from a distance and he knows this. The father knows this. That if the boy enters the village and tries to make his way through the streets, that the crowd is going to feel totally different than he does. And they will mock him and ridicule him. Some of them may throw stones at him, laugh at him, tell him to go away, that he's not here. He doesn't deserve to be here. He doesn't belong in this community. Some of them would have even rejoiced and been happy about his condition. I know Christians. I guess they're Christians. That's why we got three more sermons. You got to, The last one is the most important one. We have Christians who rejoice at the pain of others. And think that's what they deserve. And if they had a chance, they would afflict that person also. They'd be satisfied. He got what he deserved. But the father, in contrast, hurts the boy. He hurts that the boy is malnourished. He hurts that the boy has been humiliated by having to feed pigs. He hurts because the boy has traveled all this way with no help from anyone. He could look at his son and he could say, my boy has brought all this upon himself. His life has been horrifically hard because of his stupidity. But I still hurt for my boy. I cannot stand to see my boy suffer such pain and reproach. And that's true of our God. And that's what this story is trying to tell you. God takes no pleasure in your suffering and in your shame and in your hurt. And he demonstrated to you and me again and again by healing lepers, giving dead children back to parents, healing the sick, casting out demons. Even though many of these people brought these infirmities, these problems upon themselves, Jesus still suffered for them and he worked to ease their suffering. He had great compassion on people as his father does. And God has compassion on you and you and you and you. Now I'm going to tell you something. When Jesus is telling the story and the crowd is hearing this, they begin to feel a little uneasy because they're really thinking the father should banish this boy or stone him. But they cannot understand while Jesus is saying this man has compassion on this wicked sinner. 
There are churches who rejoice over how holy they are and that they are far better than so many others. And they rejoice over their holiness and the sinfulness of others. They're so legalistic, they don't know God as they should. And this story is not what they really expected to hear. It would be a far better story if the father would punish the son for his sinfulness and wickedness. But they're still thinking, the boy, maybe Jesus will salvage his father and the boy will still be a villain. So we move from eyes to heart to legs. And they are going to be scandalized by the next two words. And ran. They didn't expect this dad to run. Let me tell you something. The only people who ran were criminals and children. Jewish adult men, dignified men, did not run at all. Let me tell you how culturally it was wrong for someone to run in this time. This father didn't stroll. He didn't walk slowly. He didn't take his time. He ran with all he had to get to that boy before he got in the village to suffer ridicule from everybody else. But the father not only ran, what you have to understand, he brought shame on himself because when he ran, he wore robes and he had to hold these robes up. And when he did, they could see his bare legs. And in that culture, that was shameful. And the crowd is scandalized that God would run, that he would run. And Luke, being a well-educated man, knew what he was writing. And so the compassion the father had for the son caused him to run. Run as though he was running a race. And he hadn't done that ever in his life since he became an adult man. But now he races down that road, that road with his robe pulled up and his legs bared before everybody. Shaming himself. Why? Because he knows what his son will face from the village. And he takes that shame and humiliation upon himself. For the first time, love becomes visible to this boy. That's what the cross is. It's a visible sign to you and me that God loves us. And for the first time, this boy is able to understand that his father really loves him. And I want you to, hopefully you understand, God loves you. He's home. He's not in the house. He's not in his own bedroom. He's not at the kitchen table. But he's home. And home is his father's arms. And God has his arms open for you. Thank you for listening to Sermons from Silver Moon with Pastor Phil Barber. To find out more about today's message, you may contact the Silver Moon Full Gospel Church at 417-472-3360. The Silver Moon Full Gospel Church is located on Highway 59 North between Neosho and Diamond, Missouri. Morning worship is at 10 a.m. with a Wednesday night service at 6.30 p.m. The Silver Moon Full Gospel Church, where the distance is worth the difference.